My Mother, The Person and the Patient is an original podcast written and hosted by me, Fortuna Cuso. This podcast is about my mother, Timira Abdus Samad Muhammad, Ayaya we call her, and that's the Somali word for grandmother, and her great grandchildren call her Ayaya too, and that is their way of saying great grandmother. As you probably already know, if you have listened to the other episodes in this podcast, and if you haven't, I suggest that you start from the beginning and listen to the entire season because the stories are done, especially the second half of every episode, in a chronological order. And it will be really, really enriching if you are able to start at the top and listen from episode one to where we are now so you can keep up with the story, especially the second half of the episode. So you will find that I consider Alzheimer's as an enemy. I call it a thief that slinks away and takes one piece off my mother every time. Also, it's unpredictable disease that moves fast at one point and slows down at another. And there is really no way to know what's on the other side of that day. And also, I see Alzheimer's as so individual. There is no way to say this happens and this happens. Every sufferer experiences it differently. But now, since my daughter's murder, I see it differently. In the last episode last week, I spoke about how I see Alzheimer's as a comfort to my mother. Because of her level of cognitive decline, my mother is unaware of what had happened. And that, I think, is comfort to her because she would have been devastated as much as I am and the rest of the family is, if not more. And not knowing what's going on, it's almost a blanket of protection for her. And in this episode, I want to share with you how my mother is Alzheimer's and myself as her caregiver is being comfort to me on two levels. First one is, as a caregiver to my mother, is giving me a purpose and realize my daughter would be proud of me if she knew I'm still moving on and continue to take care of her grandmother. Because last thing she'd ever said to me on that last phone call on May 26th was, give grandmother a kiss for me and I'll see you Monday. So that was her last thought to me. So so that I'm taking comfort in that. Also, I'm taking comfort in the idea that the similarity between my mother going through a very abusive marriage when she was a young woman and the abuse my daughter went through before her murder, the 18 years leading to her murder. And also listening to people that tell me why doesn't woman leave, the woman who stay or found themselves in such relationships are not smart enough or they're not brave enough or they're not strong enough. Also, looking back on my mother's story and comparing it to my daughter's, I could clearly see the cost when woman tries to get out of an abusive relationship, the level of cost, the depth of that cost for my mother, it cost her to give up her parental rights to her two children. And she would always say, absent mother is better than a dead one. That was the cost for my mother to save herself. As soon as she decided to leave, she had to give up the custody of her kids. And my daughter, when she tried to leave, it cost her her life. So knowing women are facing really dreadful choices in trying either to stay and survive in that relationship or leave And that has made all the difference. 
When you listen to how we arrived at my mother's diagnosis and what followed, it's so easy to see her just as the patient, to see her as nothing more than the disease that reduced her to shell of her old self. But I want also to tell you about my mother, the person, the fierce woman that told her stories unapologetically, celebrating the beautiful parts and harsh realities equally. I want to share with you the stories she told us about her life as a girl growing up in a small village, the tales that marked her adulthood. I want to share with you all her losses and the ultimate winnings. The following chapter is one of those stories reconstructed from my childhood memory. The fight that occurred only four months after she stopped breastfeeding her son was epic, a great deal fiercer than any other beatings Timira had suffered in his hands. What made it even worse was the event that led to it. The weeks that preceded that fight, Hassan was in a foul mood. Anger worse than any he'd exhibited before filled him for days. The grain he'd bought the previous summer to sell for profit fetched much less than he'd paid. He traveled to bigger cities hoping to get more for the crops to no avail. It cost me more in travel fees, he raved. No matter what I do, this market refuses to get out of its slump. He complained how the family was costing him too much even after he'd placed them in rations. He refused to buy the staples like flour, sugar, and cooking oil if they finished before the ration date. One of those weeks... Hassan's mother ran out of sugar before Timira did. Timira gave her a cup of sugar to use. Giving and taking were common between the two, but she never shared the practice with her husband. You're cutting back some more? She asked him the following day when he'd announced the portions for the upcoming week. I have two children. You have to make do, he said. Timura placed a plate of fried chicken and baked potatoes on the table before him. Impossible! She'd never spoken to him like that before. The worry of running out of something and not having dinner ready for him and the children pushed her to speak her mind. Even your mother is unable to make it through the week. His eyes opened wide when she mentioned she'd given his mother a cup of sugar. She didn't think the information would raise such rage in her husband. Timira used the anecdote to point out how unreasonably small the allotments were. She didn't know when and how Hassan had moved her son sitting on his lap. Timira didn't know when he got up and reached for her. But when she realized what was happening, she was on the floor beneath her husband's Total weight, her face was on top of the shards of glass of what was left of the pitcher of lemonade she was holding. The last thing she remembered before the attack, as he pounded her on the head, on her back, all she could hear was her two children crying, calling for him to stop, calling for her to get up. The metallic taste of the blood from the cuts on her face from the glass filled her mouth when she attempted to cry out for help. Stop! Timura's father-in-law came into the room, his wife in tow. He repeated the order three times before the blows slowed and finally stopped. Are you trying to kill her? Hassan's mother scooped Timira in her arms and began wiping her face with her scarf. Together with her husband, they moved Timira to her bed. 
Her father-in-law left the room and returned with a piece of wood and long strip of fabric. I think it's broken. He placed the wood under her elbow and wound the material around it. This would help until we could get you to the doctor. This can't continue. Hassan's mother addressed her husband, not when we are in the house. You are right. Hassan's father agreed with his wife. They took her to the doctor without asking for his permission next morning. They made him pay for the cast on her arms and the ointment for her face and upper body cuts. They instructed her she stay in bed until she was better and told him to leave her be. Their actions sparked strong hope in Timiro that his parents realized their son had gone too far. They wouldn't allow him to go any further. But three weeks after the beating, their fury fizzled into a quiet acceptance of his horrible actions. Gradually, they let him ask Timiro to bring his food and put the children to bed. Their anger wouldn't extend beyond the height of her painful weeks. It was up to her to protect herself before it was too late. A month after the severe beating, her wounds still fresh and achy. Timira went to the market and sent the letter to her father. Timira directed all her attention to the pot of corn and beans bubbling over the hot coal before she spoke. I sent for my father today. She was sure her mother-in-law had suspected that when she went to the market alone. They always went together, so Timira leaving without Hassan's mother was out of the norm. But her return from the market without buying anything dispelled any doubt. For what? her mother-in-law asked. I asked him to come with our elder and collect me. She wasn't telling Hassan's mother something she didn't expect. What else was she to do? What would come after bruised body and broken bones? Death, Timiro shuddered as that word penetrated her thoughts. What about the children? Her mother-in-law asked the question Timiro wasn't prepared to hear, no matter how logical the inquiry. What about them? Timiro and her mother-in-law knew what she was talking about. The fact that The children couldn't be taken out of their tribal land, away from their people, and their father wasn't lost on either of them. But Timira hoped the injuries that littered her body would give her the upper hand for her not to be considered abandoning the marriage. They would think her act as saving her life, would they not? Her father and their elder could mount a case for her safety. She was sure of it. Wait till they see how she'd been battered. Stay with your husband. Her mother-in-law stared away from her. Children need their mother and father together. So he could kill me? Hassan's mother flinched as if Timur's question had shocked her, as if she couldn't see her battered body black eyes and broken arm. You know he will. Timira watched Hassan's mother as she got up and walked over to Hassan's father, sitting on his prayer mat near the kitchen. Their words only reached Timira in whispers, but she suspected they were discussing the situation. Her father-in-law gathered his shawl around him only a few minutes after their talk. May peace be upon you, he said, and left the house. Hours passed before Hassan's father returned. His face was streaked with lines of worry Timur hadn't noticed before. He seemed shaken. I left the message for our elder to meet us tomorrow. Why? Timur asked. She knew it was too late if her father-in-law intended that to lead to a reconciliation, for there was no way she could stay with Hassan, not after the last beating. 
discuss the matter and find the solution before your father arrives. A solution? How could Hassan's father think they could get to a solution? His parents had no sway over him, not even enough to stop his attacks. Timiro, Hassan and his parents were in the courtyard when a boy carrying a message from the elder approached. It was Friday morning. The elder wants to meet you. The boy spoke loudly to ensure he'd been heard. He wants the entire family after the Friday prayer. Does he want the men only or all of us? Timira's mother-in-law asked the question, perhaps for her son's benefit. He said everyone. The boy turned around and took off toward the main gate. Hassan didn't question why the elders sent for the family as Timira had feared. It was common for families to be invited by the elder for various reasons, engagements, birth announcements, settling disputes, or sharing a meal. I have called you here. The elder, a short, thin man, spoke with a measured tone. Timira's husband sat on the cushioned chair opposite to the elder. He leaned to the side, resting his elbow on the left armrest of the chair. The way he tilted his head back slightly, his eyes narrowed to small openings. He seemed to ask questions quietly. Timur knew his parents didn't tell him about the meeting. His father made her promise not to say anything. The elder opened the meeting with a prayer. May Allah guide us to the right action and reaction, he concluded. Amin, Timira and the rest of the people in the room said in unison, except for Hassan. Do you know why we're here? The elder asked Hassan directly. I didn't ask for a meeting, Hassan said. Your father did. You called a meeting? Hassan directed the question at his father. For what? Hassan's father flinched. We are here to solve a conflict between you and your wife. His father spoke. His gaze never left his son's face. He was watching him closely. What conflict? Hassan asked. You and your wife shouldn't have allowed this to happen. The elder looked to Hassan's parents, not after what had happened with his first wife. His first wife? The question left Timira's mouth before she thought to ask it. Hassan was married before? Neither the elder, his wife, nor her in-laws responded to her question. What else didn't she know about this man? What secrets lurked in the shadows of her troubled life with him? How long were you married? For the first time? Timira locked her gaze with her husband. That's none of your business, he said. How long was he married? Timira turned to Hassan's parents with a determined gaze that demanded a response. She got none. Her words seemed to fall into the space between these people and her. Hassan's father sighed, a deep and agonizing sigh before he spoke. Ali, you know how he is. He was looking at the elder, almost bleeding for an understanding. I don't know how he is. The elder seemed to be getting angrier after each word he'd uttered. What I know is a woman died. A woman died? Timira's heart jumped her throat. His wife died? The elder his wife and Hassan's parents paid no mind to her as if they couldn't hear her. What do you mean a woman died? Timira got up and stood in front of Hassan. Your first wife died? She held his gaze within hers to make sure he responded. She died in your house? She moved even closer. Her big toe was touching his. She didn't die in my house. For the first time? 
Hassan sounded as if he was trying to defend himself from wrongdoings. She died at her family's home. For the injuries she'd suffered here, the elder said, the injuries you inflicted on her. She claimed Hassan was still in his defensive mode. What? Timur staggered under the weight of the revelation. And that's why we had to pay blood money to avoid going into war. The elder wasn't speaking to Hassan anymore. He directed his words toward his parents. All for what? So your son can bring more problems? The elder's anger was not for Timur's benefit. He was upset over what Hassan's actions had caused the tribe. Still, he gave Timiro information she didn't have all these years. Timiro is not like his last wife, her mother-in-law said. What did she mean by that? Timiro didn't know and she didn't care. But Hassan is the same man and you and your husband are watching him do it again. The elder's eyes remained fixed on Hassan's parents. Her mother-in-law put her elbow on her knees and rested her chin on her hand. She'd said nothing. What will Timiro's people think about us when they see her like this? The elder's wife pointed to Timiro's arm in cast and sling. Are we a savage tribe? Timiro sat up straight and looked at Hassan's parents. They had done nothing to stop their son, even though they knew what he could do. Another woman had died in their son's hands. Did they not see a glimpse of Timur's death approaching? Sharing a home with Hassan was far scarier now than it had been just a couple of hours ago. Who will marry his son? The elder's wife's words pulled Timur back into the reality of her situation. I wouldn't allow my granddaughter to be near him. What are you talking about? Hassan shouted. It's merely a husband and a wife squabbling. You broke her arm. The elder sounded surprised at Hassan's claim. What's next? Kill her? She is my wife. Hassan spoke as if the fact that Timur was married to him justified the way he'd battered her. I hope that's not your answer when her father and his elder come. The elder said, she sent for her father already. Sent for her father? Hassan leaped forward, far out of his chair. His eyes bugged out of his head. She did? They might be here this day or next, Hassan's father said. You knew this and didn't tell me? Hassan was outraged. No, he was beyond outraged. He was incensed by the betrayal inflicted on him by those he'd considered family, people he'd worked so hard to support. Did you know this? That was to his mother. He was out of his chair by then. He stood between Timiro and his mother, still in their seats. His six feet, two inch frame loomed over them. Did you know she'd sent for her father to break this family up? She has the right to seek help from her elder and her father, the elder said, like we are here on your side, on my side, like you were last time? Hassan's question came at the elder like daggers intended to wound. By ambushing me with a meal disguised as a visit? We have to deal with this before her people get here. The elder spoke with a little more firmness. Now is the time. This is my family, and I will deal with it as I see fit. Hassan extended his hand in Timira's direction. Come, we are going home. Timira pulled away from him. This was the first time she defied him publicly, but she had to. She couldn't follow him in the condition he was in. I am not going. Do you see what you've done? Hassan's eyes moved from one person to another, starting with the elder on one end and resting on his father on the other. You encourage the wife to refuse her husband's orders. He is sneered. I tell you, I won't stand for it, not for any of it. 
he turned on his heels and walked toward the door. Hassan, Hassan, his father called. We have to discuss this before it's too late. It's too late already, Hassan said and left. My mother, the person and the patient can be found in Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember to follow, like, and share, and join me next week as I share with you another episode of my mother's journey as both the person and the patient. Thank you.